Hey, welcome to the shop. Today I'm going to demonstrate five different wire feed welding processes, three with solid wire and two with flux cord. In case you're unfamiliar with wire feed welding in general, I'll give a 28 second summary. There's a spool of wire which is loaded into a feeder that's often integrated into the machine. There's an electric motor that feeds the wire down through a lead and out a gun when you pull the trigger. There's a work clamp that connects to your workpiece to complete a circuit and electricity passes from the end of the wire to the workpiece in an arc creating a lot of heat to melt the metal and join it together while wire is fed in to add additional material to the weld. Around the outside of the wire, gas is able to feed and protect that molten metal from the weld pool. I'm just tacking together some material to form some T-joints to demonstrate these processes. The first process we'll look at is the most common for general fabrication. It's called short circuit gas metal arc welding. Now with short circuit MIG or often called short arc, you actually have your wire that feeds out of the gun go and contact your work. Then it'll burn back and then the arc will go out and it'll go up and contact it again. So you don't have a continuous arc. That's why you hear that kind of frying bacon sound during this weld. Let's run some. Most MIG welders that you buy that are set up to use shielding gas are going to run short circuit MIG. You'll notice that I'm steadying myself with both hands to just maintain a consistent steady travel speed and while I'm welding I do a little bit of manipulation however I keep that wire right there in the puddle. Notice those sparks that fly off. That can create something called spatter, little BBs around the weld and that's just the nature of the process with that short circuit happening over and over again. It's overall a really versatile process. You can see that the weld came out pretty clean and smooth, though there are a couple little spatter BBs. However, with the machine dialed in like it was, it's not bad. Now the obvious question is, why would you want to have your wire short out like that over and over again rather than the arc being on all the time? And the reason is that it limits the rate at which heat enters your material and gives you a little bit more control to weld in the vertical or overhead positions or to handle thinner materials. There are a few drawbacks though. One is you get some spatter and also because it runs a little bit colder, you can end up with welds where it's not fused all the way to the bottom of the joint, especially on thicker material when you're running short circuit MIG welding. This brings us to the next process we'll look at, which is gas metal arc welding with a spray transfer. Now with the spray transfer, what's happening is the arc is on all the time and so the metal sprays off of the end of the wire in tiny droplets. The way to achieve a spray transfer is one, by having the right type of shielding gas. In this case, I'm using 90% argon and 10% CO2. The other thing is your settings, right? A MIG welder is kind of like a musical instrument. You could use it to play jazz or classical. So by tuning some of those settings on a capable machine, you're able to hit a spray transfer. Not all machines are capable of doing this, but the higher end ones will. The first thing to notice is the sound is much more like a steady hiss rather than that frying bacon because the arc is on all the time. I'm moving along in a bit of a push angle, which is usually the best for spray transfer, and you'll notice how much more fume there is when I weld this. The arc comes off in a cone, and because of that, I can just move along as steadily as I can, and I come out with a result that's pretty smooth. Now that spray transfer works pretty well. With the arc on all the time, you don't get as much spatter coming off and you have a hotter pool, so you're less likely to have some of the defects that you can have with short circuit MIG welding. On the other hand, it is really hot, so you're limited to running in the flat or horizontal positions and also it's difficult to run on thinner material. The next process we're gonna look at has a lot of the advantages of both short circuit MIG and spray transfer. And this is pulsed MIG, or in particular, it's a pulsed spray transfer. Now with a pulsed spray transfer, what's happening is you're changing your amperage between a higher and a lower level automatically over and over again. So you keep that spray arc going all the time, but you limit the overall heat energy that goes into the material by alternating between that higher and lower amperage. Let me show you how that works. I'll just start off by mentioning that this is a feature that you'll really only find in higher end machines. Now if you notice that there's that buzzing sound, that is the amperage moving up and down automatically by the machine. Compared with short circuit, it's really like going from a carburetor to fuel injection where this whole thing is electronically controlled 
and I'm able to keep that nice spray transfer and come off with a spatter-free, clean, smooth weld. Now that pulse spray transfer laid in pretty slick, and it's really nice because you have some of the benefits of spray transfer, like reduced spatter and reduced opportunity for defects. However, you can still weld in different welding positions or on thinner material because you're limiting the rate at which that heat energy goes in with the pulsed feature. All of the welding we've done so far has been with solid wires, and we're gonna switch gears and look at two different processes that use flux cord wires. Now what a flux cord wire is, is it's a metal tube and the metal on the outside of it actually adds filler material into your weld where the center is filled with a powder called flux. And this flux serves a few different purposes. In the first one we'll look at, it actually protects the weld pool from the air in the atmosphere and that means that you don't have to use a shielding gas with it. That's great to make it really portable and also makes it much less expensive to get into flux cord arc welding. Some of the equipment for this can be really inexpensive. In fact, I'm gonna use a uh, base model big box store machine here because it already has the wire loaded in. That way it won't have to change the wire out on the revolution to demonstrate this. Notice how this machine doesn't even have a gas nozzle. It just has that round tip with the wire feeding out of it. Now as the wire feeds out, you can see there is a lot more spatter, a lot of little BBs that fly off of the weld here, and that's really just the nature of the process. Some machines and some wires do it more than others, but I've never found a way to get away from it completely on self-shielded flux core. Notice how slowly I'm moving. This is because of the type of machine that I'm using. In some industrial applications, flux core welding can actually be really fast, but material is deposited pretty slowly in this case. Either way, when I finish up, because I have that flux that shields the molten metal from the atmosphere, I need to remove a coating called slag. I can just rake over it a little bit with the chipping hammer to break it up and then clean it up the rest of the way with the wire brush. You can see there's a bit of spatter there on the part compared with others, which is inconvenient, but it's not too big of a deal given what we're working with and some of the advantages. So I think self-shielded flux core is great for anyone getting started. It's also used in heavy industry all the time and it works really well in outdoor situations where you might have some breeze or wind that would blow a gas away but that flux can still protect your molten weld pool. The last process we're gonna look at is another flux cord process. It's gas shielded flux cord arc welding. So you use a shielding gas along with a flux cord wire, and the flux cord wire is a completely different formulation than you'd run with self-shielded flux core. Now you might be wondering if you have to run a shielding gas, why do you wanna mess with flux cord wire? Well, there are a few advantages to gas shielded flux core, which is often called dual shield, it's trade name, and those are one, it's really easy to run out of position compared to a lot of the solid wire processes, like in the vertical and overhead positions, it runs really well. And two, it has really good properties, particularly impact properties where something's gonna be loaded over and over again, like a trailer hitch or something like that. So you might wanna look at using it there. In order to run this, I need to change the wire out here from the solid wire we've used for most of these demos. I'm loading in this gas shielded flux core wire and I'm going to feed it with a different type of drive roll that has these knurls in the grooves. That helps that tubular wire to feed a little bit better. Notice how much less spatter there is than the self shielded flux core. I mean this stuff runs really smoothly and it's really nice to run. It's just pretty forgiving and easy to uh, get a nice result out. As I weld along here, notice I have a little bit longer uh, length between the end of my gun and the work. This allows the wire to preheat and lets that flux start working. Notice how the slag comes off pretty easily and I can brush a little bit so we can take a look. Now you can see that I was a little bit shaky myself, however the weld still lays in nice and smooth and that surface is kind of the appearance that you typically get with a uh, gas shielded flux cord arc weld. All right, well, we have just barely scratched the surface on wire feed welding processes. You know, there are even more than these that we've talked about. For most people, you're gonna wanna run either short circuit MIG or a flux cord weld, self-shielded flux core. That's gonna be the bread and butter for most people getting started, but it's worth being aware of all of these different types. Now, whether you are just starting out with welding or you've been at it for a while and you're struggling to make welds that you're proud of, what you need is a plan. It's really good to gain knowledge as much as you can from videos like this. 
However, when it comes to actually applying that to produce welds that you're really proud of, that takes a step-by-step, -step, hands-on plan where you're doing the work. I struggled with this for years, and that's why I put together my online courses that I've linked down in the description. And in there, I walk you through every step of the way so that you don't have to struggle for years to actually produce a weld you're proud of. You just have a straightforward path to completion. You have to put in the work, but I'll show you exactly what to do every step of the way. Hey, thank you so much. I can't tell you how much I appreciate everyone who watches these videos, hits that like button, leaves me a comment. It's really awesome to be a part of this and that we can all share and learn together online here. Till next time, weld safely and we'll see you then.